I'm John Riley, here with Bob Letterer, co-producers of Out FM. Today, we're presenting part one of a two-part series on an exciting new multimedia website of ACT UP's Oral History Project, available at actuporalhistory.org. It's an archive of 187 interviews with surviving members of the New York chapter of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, recorded between 2002 and 2017. The overall oral history project has been coordinated by Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman with principal camera work by James Wincy and contributions by others. The new website relaunch has been organized by Jim Hubbard. ACT UP, founded in March 1987, is a diverse nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. At its height in the early 90s, ACT UP had some 150 chapters in cities around the world, largely in the global north. ACT UP's determined advocacy and highly focused demonstrations supported by innovative graphics utterly changed the world's perception of people with AIDS and queer people. This last description, found on the actuporalhistory.org website, introduces uh, uh, the, the viewers to some of the in-depth coverage of the accomplishments of one of the most effective and influential U.S. LGBTQ activist groups in recent decades. This site is a great source of political and tactical decisions that challenge government policy and inaction at a time when the U.S. HIV epidemic was killing hundreds of thousands and infecting more than a million young men and some women. It reveals some of the ways that the group was able to capture the attention of the mass media and communicate to the public at large about government and corporate failures that jeopardize so many uh, lives of people living with HIV and AIDS. As the website says, quote, the ACT UP movement, along with its allies, radically altered the medical research and drug approval process in the United States and the doctor-patient relationship while its four-year campaign to change the CDC definition of AIDS to include opportunistic infections affecting women and injection drug users saved millions of lives across the world. The Latina, Latino caucus fostered not only AIDS activism, but jump-started LGBT activism in Puerto Rico. Joining us to discuss the project and the newly launched website is queer filmmaker and activist Jim Hubbard, who directed the 2012 film United in Anger, A History of ACT UP, documenting various ACT UP campaigns, which also draws heavily from the Oral History Project interviews. Jim co-produced that film with lesbian author and activist Sarah Schulman. Welcome to Out FM, Jim Hubbard. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here and talking to you about, about the ACT UP Oral History project in the new website. Power! Every half hour! Every half hour! Someone dies of AIDS! Murder by omission! Change the definition! Murder by omission! Change the definition! I'm before I have to die before you join the fight! because of what's happened with AIDS, that people in the United States opinion about uh, the lesbian and gay community has been falling throughout the 80s. That Stop blocking AIDS treatment! Stop blocking AIDS treatment! Stop blocking AIDS treatment! This is part two of our interview with Jim Hubbard, who along with longtime lesbian activist and author Sarah Schulman, co-founded the ACT UP Oral History Project two decades ago, which has been massively expanded and relaunched, including videoed interviews with 187 members of the Direct Action AIDS organization, ACT UP New York, as well as footage of some of their actions and meetings to document the wide range of issues which the group worked on. ACT UP's militant direct actions changed the public debate on AIDS and the LGBT communities rights by capturing the spotlight. Jim, can you first start uh, uh, and talk about how this project came to be? Well, the project actually began in June of 2001. It was the 20th anniversary of AIDS. And um, Sarah was in LA driving a car, which as a native New Yorker, she probably shouldn't do, um, while listening to a uh, 
um, a radio broadcast which said at first Americans were upset by AIDS, but then they got used used to it. Um, and so she called me up screaming and, and yelling saying we have to do something about this incredible erasure of the work of thousands of AIDS activists who forced the US government to deal with the AIDS crisis, who forced the pharmaceutical industry to do the, the work to get those drugs out and forced the US mainstream media to deal with people with AIDS in a more humane and complex manner. And we decided that the best thing we could do was allow people to speak for themselves and to, to do an oral history and just let people tell their own stories. And so that's what we, we did. We did it you know, for nearly, well, for 15 years or more. And uh, in the beginning, it was made possible because of um, a substantial grant from the Ford Foundation, which was um, made possible by Urvashi Bad, who was working at, at Ford at the time. And um, so, you know, we just we just did the work, and we just allowed allowed people to tell their stories. I think that's the important part, and and the complexity um, and the range of issues comes out through people telling their own stories. And indeed, it's really a treasure trove of video and photos about that <clears throat> early era of especially between 87 and, and 94, but even beyond that, because it brings in uh, the sort of eyewitness accounts of people that have been with the organization for the full range of the 30 years um, in this 187 um, uh, interviews. So uh, what we wanted to do is to dive right into one of those uh, interviews. This is a short excerpt. And uh, the person that will be speaking is David Robinson, who discusses the use of political funerals to hold the government responsible for the deaths of people with HIV and AIDS. And in this interview, he begins by talking about his lover, Warren, who has died of AIDS and was cremated and uh, how he wanted to use the ashes in some meaningful way. Warren died in April of 92. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we did the ashes action in October of 92. You know, I said around that time of the year, I, I, people, you know, I was in contact with friends back there and they were talking about wanting to do some action. I had been wanting to, Warren, th that idea of a political funeral really hit a chord with Warren. And actually, if he hadn't died, if he hadn't gotten dementia, we would have changed his will and, and arranged for his body actually to be brought. But things progressed too, too quickly. So I was going to send his ashes to the White House, you know, uh, privately, but that really bothered me that it was just be this, you know, no one would know. Um, and I, I talked with friends in New York and they immediately said, oh, well, yeah, we've been, some people have been talking about it. Yeah, we'll organize an action. You know, and, and they did. And, you know, Shane Butler, tiny little newbie who's out here, by the way, mm -hmm. I just realized yeah, he's out here now. Um, Alexis Danzig's father had Alexis, died. He had died. Of AIDS, yeah. Um, so Alexis did it. And um, Mark Schuf's. Oh, that's right. Mark Schuf's was there. Um, Eric Sawyer. I think he had Larry Kurtz ashes. I mean, a number of people. And some people I didn't even know. People came from other places. So, and that was the weekend of the, the quilt was, was being shown. And I had gotten to the point where I felt the quilt was being used mostly in a really dangerous way. It was being used, you know, now George Bush Sr. would read names, you know, mm -hmm. like that sort of stuff. It was a way to actually give the right wing cover because it was so beautiful and everyone mm -hmm. could come. And I don't mean to sound, I made a, a panel for Warren though, it was very confident. <laughs> it's really, it's kind of terrible now. I think about, oh my God, I was so angry, but it's like, you know, uh, the silence equals that logo, but it's like, you know, his name and his dates and, you know, dead because of your inaction. That's true. Yeah. You know, it was, <laughs> it was the angriest panel I had seen. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of us agreed that um, we wanted to show the truth of the unvarnished truth. Don't pretty this up in any way. What has come out of this epidemic? 
its ashes, its bone chips, its, you know. And so with, with ACT UP New York doing really almost all the logistics, um, and my providing just feedback and input from uh, San Francisco, you know, we arranged this action. I flew out there, and, and although it didn't get a lot of press, it was this extremely important moment for a lot of people who had been, particularly had been ACT UP for quite a while, um, that it was a way we dealt with our grief at that time in a way that we hadn't in a lot of other demonstrations. And that was ACT UP activist David Robinson the, discussing the use of political funerals. Um, and he talks from the personal point of view of uh, using the ashes of his lover uh, to directly take to the White House the message that the government was killing people with AIDS by their inaction and incompetent handling of the epidemic. Um, so can you talk, Jim Hubbard, just a little bit about the use of political funerals um, and how the tactic was borrowed from some other freedom struggles? Um, yeah, I guess I can, you know, I mean, it's um, surprisingly moving hearing David, uh, even though I've heard that passage, uh, I don't know, dozens of times. Um, you know, and you can see there's the, the fo actual footage of David throwing Warren's ashes onto that, the White House lawn uh, in the other section on on the ACT UP oral history website. So um, the, the political funerals came from several sources. I mean, one, one was the, the, the famous quote from David Wojnarowicz, who wrote that, he, um, in, this is a terrible para paraphrase, but um, that instead of burial, they should drive 100 miles an hour down to Washington, DC and throw his body on the steps of the White House or steps of the FDA. Um, so that was one aspect of it. And of course, um, there were political funerals in the, the struggles in, in Ireland for, for decades. Um, and, and there was also use of political funerals in South Africa and, and in Palestine. So, so it was a way of taking, you know, like the literal body that that the the political powers that be, you know, turn this human being into a corpse, and and to, you know, force force the issue and say this is what you did, um, and and as David says, also as a way of dealing with with grief because one one of the things tenets of ACT UP was to, um, what is it, turn, oh, now I'm not going to get it right, turn turn grief into anger and into to action. In the next clip, ACT UP member Betty Williams discusses the situation that inspired ACT UP to work with Haitian activists to shut down the Guantanamo concentration camp that had been set up for people living with HIV um, who were uh, seeking political asylum in the US. And um, under both the Bush senior and Clinton administrations, they were uh, indefinitely detaining Haitian refugees um, in the Guantanamo camp, the same camp, which uh, to this day still detains Muslim men swept up by US military and uh, repressive actions in the so-called war on terror, and um, many of whom were tortured and um, are still awaiting trial all these years later. 11,000 Haitians fled in boats, were picked up by the Coast Guard and taken to Guantanamo. Of those, all of them, on their arrival there without their knowledge or consent were tested for HIV at the same time that they were given, I think, seven different immunizations at once. These were people who would never 
many of them been to a doctor in their lives. Anyone who protested was put in restraints to have their blood drawn. And about 300 of them were found to be HIV positive. They noticed everyone else was being sent to the U.S. so they could apply for asylum. Asylum can only be requested in this country. Refugees are people who get to a place that, that can offer refugee status in their own country. Asylees have to get to the country they feel will keep them safe and apply for asylum there. These folks were kept in complete limbo, the ones with HIV. The, the law, the real HIV ban had not yet been passed, but they were all herded into little school buses one day and taken to a remote part of the base, exactly where Camp X-Ray and Camp Delta and so forth are now exactly in the same place, which is up against the Cuban fence line, which is mined, the ocean on another side, and just the sort of arid wasteland on the other two sides, and you can't see any other human beings. They were ushered into the camp, surrounded by big rolls of razor wire, they had these kind of mini tanks there with like sort of little bulldozer things in the front all lined up ready to push into them. The military had those big bulletproof plastic masks over their helmets, they were carrying big batons and had police dogs. And then a doctor in full military drag got up and because it was believed that Haitians culturally did not have the same needs for privacy that the rest of us do, they were told over a loudspeaker in the immortal words of Tuskegee that they had bad blood and that George Bush's doctor was going to fix them up, not to worry. And that was ACT UP member Betty Williams talking about the work she was part of to close the um, the first, really the world's first HIV detention camp, concentration camp on uh, Guantanamo uh, prison in Cuba. Karen Ramspacker, also a member of ACT UP, talks about the fact that many ACT UP members were concerned that the government was illegally infiltrating the group. In the interview, Karen Ramspacker talks about a group called WAM, which is short for the Women's Health Action Mobilization, which was a uh, radical uh, women's rights organization that focused in on reproductive rights and was involved in a number of actions with ACT UP, including Stop the Church. Certainly, actually, one that I remember very well with Robert Garcia there taking a bus with me was um, at the Holland Tunnel. And that was a very covert action where the planning was very secret and there were lots of affinity groups. And the point was that all these different affinity groups got in front of the Holland Tunnel from different directions. So you had your little, you know, your group of 20 people and you knew exactly what you guys were doing, but you didn't know what everybody else was doing. That way, if any one group couldn't get there, there would still be, there were about 200 people who laid in front of the Holland Tunnel that day and, and messed up traffic. Now this was unusual action because it, did it ever come to the floor of ACT UP? No. Because this was a top secret or action, right. which was right. very unusual. That was right. never how we operated before. Right. Why was this action done differently than every other action? Well, I think at the time it was contextual because I think at the time there had probably been a number of actions that had been, you know, intervened, perhaps. Like, like what? Like, did you have an example? Mm -hmm. Not off the top of my head, but there had been actions where people were trying to do things and couldn't do them. So, the thought was, let's keep this really quiet and do it in affinity groups, and therefore, one affinity group's going to get it done. And I think it was more of an act, it was more of an act up issue than it was a wham issue because wham 
I don't think anybody was paying attention to what WAM was doing from a legal perspective. Um, we had done some great affinity group actions like dropping a banner over the face of the Statue of Liberty, which I know Steve Quester talked about, right? I think he did. Mm -hmm. um, and it said, no liberty, no choice, over the face of the Statue of Liberty. And then there was a banner at the bottom that said, abortion is health care, health care is a right. We did it, no busts. And I was back at Press Central answering calls. So if you Google you know, my name and Statue of Liberty, you'll find me talking to the AP about it, even though I wasn't there. <laughs> because you're never at the action if you're doing press. Mm -hmm. Note for future activists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I still, I'm trying to get at something larger, yeah. which okay. was that this action took place at a time in which ACT UP had a fear of mm -hmm. infiltration or yes. that there were discussions by some people in ACT UP that perhaps there was some kind of infiltration. Yes. Now, do you know any of the details of that? Did you ever have evidence of that? No. Okay. And it was one of the things that tore ACT UP apart at that time. I mean, I think certain aspects of ACT UP healed, but it was a tough time. So it was great that this action was able to be pulled off, but there was definitely a sense among the major organizers that it be very, very covert and quiet. But looking back in hindsight, do you believe that there actually was infiltration, or do you think yes. it was paranoia? No. Do you think it was? Yes. And so that was Karen Ramspacker talking about uh, the fact that many members of ACT UP thought that ACT UP was being infiltrated. And I think uh, there's always been a consciousness within it, the group that uh, the police do monitor our activities and our meetings. And um, the fact that so many activists had confronted high members of the ruling establishment from President Bush who denounced ACT UP on national TV to Bill Clinton, who, uh, whose comments to ACT UP member Bob Rafsky were widely broadcast. Um, so, Bob? In our next clip, ACT UP member Lola Flash discusses the um, New York Police Department's illegal use of strip searches to attempt to intimidate women from ACT UP and other groups arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. One of the greatest things I think about the actual demonstrating and then being arrested was that you knew that you weren't going to get lost in the system. And I'm sorry, being black, I don't want to, you know, I'm going to get lost in any system. And uh, so they're taking all the people, uh, like the law, law, legal people are taking your numbers down so as you go in. Now when we get in, Generally what would happen was that the guys would be in like one place and they would put the girls into another cell. Of course, because they, the, the feeling was that all the guys had H, were HIV positive, so they couldn't touch them. But all of the girls, of course, weren't. I mean, this is obviously being sarcastic. And I can remember they took us downstairs, like maybe three by three. It feels like we were in like this dark cavernous place, like a film. And I can remember, what I remember in my head was that there was these three huge black women with like yellow like like washing up gloves standing there and they're like saying okay you know empty your bra out take your pants down we're you know and they actually didn't touch us but they were acting like they were actually going to like do some kind of internal thing you know and some of the women who I, who had been abused and some of the women who just were you know me i was like you know i was really kind of just like whatever you know i really you know, it's like, okay, so that's what you have to do. You know, I'm just more laid back about that. But some women, it didn't really freak out, you know, and from that, they um, ACT UP sued the city. And that was ACT UP member Lola Flash um, describing the strip searches used against um, women on several occasions who demonstrated as part of ACT UP's nonviolent civil disobedience. And in that lawsuit that Lola mentions, it was eventually settled with a, um, a large, I think in the tens of thousands of dollars were awarded to those women for the abuse of their, the violation of their constitutional rights. But I think also, you know, more important is that the city promised not to do that. And that, right. yeah, you know, there were rules about who could be strip searched and who couldn't be. And the city broke those rules all continuously for for 30 years and they, and they broke that promise to the courts over and over and over again
Quite true. John? Next, we'll hear from one of that caucus's active members, Cesar Carrasco, who discusses the ongoing aftermath of the AIDS crisis that many continue to experience. Now, I know what it is. I mean, it's, it's the post-epidemic thing, an epidemic that doesn't just end. And then we go back to the commercial of, you know, toothpaste and, and European cars. That doesn't happen. And for me, the crystal meth epidemic or all this stuff that it happens um, with my, one of my doctors you know, got involved in you know, drugs and his career and life you know, was, was ruined. Um, it's like that, you know, like th there, was, there was no way to transition from total crisis and abnormal way of living into something that can be integrated with the, um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the daunting loss. So let me ask you this as a clinician. There's this, there's this kind of rhetoric or ideology in American culture about moving on. You should move on, move on. But something that's so huge like this, you can't move on. So if the only option you're being offered is to move on and that option is impossible, what happens to people? People people basically stay in crisis, but in a different form of crisis. You know, in, in this case was the emotional crisis, in this case is the, is the, is the post-endurance trauma crisis, not necessarily the, the soldier that comes from Iraq, you know, type of PTSD, classical things. Now, we don't know these things. I don't know if when the Black Plague ended in the Middle Ages, people really learned that they needed to do something about the, the aftermath. I, I'm sure that they started going to church and trying to rebuild their lives and going back to normality, and it was not after a while that they realized that some of them are not making it, that they are all messed up in their heads. We didn't know this. You know, I, I mean, I, do, I don't place blame. You know, I, I, I hope that we look at this and, and begin to at least try to understand it, you know, by posing the questions like the ones that you are posing, you know, um, it, it, because it was certainly we were looking in, in, in a different direction. Because now that we have viral load suppression, our generation of people who have suffered the deaths of everyone around them, who've had their own personal health crises endlessly, who've gone through all the terrible drugs, we're, that's like a lost generation because what the younger people are coming up, they get infected and they go on the meds and they don't have any of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming an even more unknown, rarefied and isolated experience. It is. It is. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Judith Rapkin at no. the Psychiatric Institute. She's documented some of these. Um, but she also kind of like looks at it from the effect of like a, not PTSD but kind of like endurance trauma type of um, psychological post danger effect and she's making she's doing this study on what is the difference in how you have metabolized or processed this experience post epidemic you know mm -hmm. from 96 to today and if there is a difference between those who were involved heavily in activism like that or people who were not involved in activism. My theory or my sense is that the people that got involved in activism like me are much more aware of what was happening. The ones that were not involved in activism, they don't know why their lives just do not make any sense. Mm -hmm. And their relationships don't make sense and they are becoming more and more kind of like alienated. I see some of that in the patients, you know, the HIV um, middle-aged patients that we treat in the clinic where I work. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it seems that they remain alive not to be able to put the, to connect the dots forever. And that was Cesar Carrasco discussing the aftermath of the AIDS crisis that many uh, survivors of HIV continue to have. So, Bob, you want to continue? And we're talking with Jim Hubbard, the um, creator of the website actuporalhistory.org, which has just been relaunched um, with a massive amount of new uh, audio, video, 
and photographic and text material. Um, so Jim, talk to us about your decision to create an entire section of that website, uh, which is actuporalhistory.org, um, about the Latina and Latino caucus, which was a, a major sub part of ACT UP that is usually not spotlighted in the mainstream histories of the organization, but, but it did have quite a significant life of about uh, four years and did many, many important actions. So talk to us about that decision and who worked with you to create that section of the site and with um, particular videos about the work of that caucus. Well, one of the problems in, in um, telling the history of ACT UP and of AIDS activism is that it's caricatured as, you know, cute white gay guy, you know, and the, the mainstream media always wanted to show the, the, the good looking white, white guy with, with HIV. And ACT UP worked against that and tried, tried to present a diverse space to the, um, to the world. But, but it continues to be a problem historically. And so what we wanted to do would make sure in doing the ACT UP Oral History Project and in making this website that the whole range of, of ACT UP was shown. So that's why there's a section on women in AIDS uh, um, as well as highlighting some of the actions. And the, the section on the Latino caucus came about because someone else did the work of collecting all this. And his name is Julian DeMaio. And he's a, a younger person who um, has been studying the Latino caucus and befriending those, those people and collecting all the material in an attempt to make sure that it survives. And so since this material was available, it was possible to do a section of the website specifically on, on the caucus. Jim, how do you want and expect that the materials on the ACT UP Oral History Project website will be used? Well, you know, I want it to be used in unexpected ways. So that's, that's um, really important to me. But I, the, what I do expect is that um, schools and universities will use it, that um, teachers and professors will use it in the classroom and that students will use it to create, um, you know, write papers, but also create um, videos or um, blogs that will include the material. But, I, but an, another thing that's really important is that activists see this material because I think that they're, that this material is a blueprint for how to do effective grassroots political organizing. And I think it's also really important that people outside the United States see this material because I think information about grassroots activity or countercultural activity, all those things that, that sustain us here in the United States um, who are you know, not living the, um, um, the standard American life. Um, those things don't get seen around the world. And the people around the world see a very narrow view of, of the United States. And I think it's important for everyone to know that there's a lot more going on here than is portrayed you know, in, in mainstream media. Well, that also seems like from um, an LGBTQ community point of view, <clears throat> some of the basic history of, you know, was influenced by ACT UP and the fact that there was a militant organization that was composed of people of all sexualities, but with a high, a high number of uh, gay men and bisexual men, um, and including lesbians that taking extremely important roles um, and, you know, being, uh, including the transgender community as well. Uh, it's very historic in how it changed perception. And it really showed how 
fighting for one's life was like a way to come out to not just your parents, but to the world. And uh, it seems like that ACT UP really did that. And it had a tremendous impact on uh, public policy in the United States. Yeah, no, I think ACT UP was, was a, a, an area where, you know, queer people actually took political power and used it to really change the world. And, but, and I think it's, so that is a, you know, sort of a uh, extension of and a fulfillment of the gay liberationist idea of actually, you know, changing the world, not just making it possible for people to say that they, you know, that they're queer in some way, but also, and, but to, you know, do it and perform it out in the world and to change the world for everybody to make it a freer place. Um, and I, and I think ACT UP continued that. And I, you know, you know, I wish we could go back to that stance that of wanting to change the world. And I, you know, I, you know, I'm a gay person who's against gay marriage. And I think, you know, that, you know, gay marriage was sort of seen as the antidote to the AIDS crisis. Gay, you know, gay, you know, gay people are saying, well, we're just like you, you know, we, we get together and we privatize our relationships and we, you know, live together and, and we don't have sex. We don't have that dirty, disgusting sex. Um, and, um, you know, I, that, you know I, I came out into gay liberation to change the world, not to assimilate into the, the worst aspects of heterosexual culture. Um, so, you know, I, I wish there were, you know, some sort of radical queer um, political group that, that, was, that is, was as powerful as ACT UP was in its heyday. Well, we certainly share that sentiment, Jim Hubbard, and we want to really applaud you on this magnificent website, actuphoralhistory.org, um, and all the, the decades of, um, of trailblazing filmmaking you've done, the creation of this project with Sarah Shulman 20 years ago, uh, the recording of 187 interviews, and the gathering together of all kinds of footage uh, of the remarkable work of this movement, um, not just your own interviews, but many other videographers, um, and with a particular emphasis on the oft-neglected uh, Latinx community, their contribution, and uh, women within the AIDS movement. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for being with us here on Out FM for this two-part series. And um, we urge everyone to go spend some serious time on actuporalhistory.org. And um, that wraps it up for this edition of Out FM. I'm Bob Letterer here with co-producer John Riley. Thank you. <laughs>